your legs. I want them in perfect condition, perfect shape. It's the only thing I've ever just... It's a fake. It's real. All right, hi guys, it's your boy Rich here, back at it again, and let's talk Tudor and why they converted me into a fan. So I haven't always been a fan of Tudor. They've just never overwhelmed me, and it's probably a watch that I wouldn't have given any attention to if they weren't associated with Rolex until now. I started following Tudor around 2013 when they relaunched themselves in the U.S. after a long period of dormancy. They've always been selling in countries outside of the U.S., but not in the U.S. And then they returned with a debut of the all-new Black Bay 41 using their first in-house movement. And this watch was so highly anticipated and well-received and it certainly garnered a lot of attention. So I wanted to see what this watch was about in person. And when I saw this watch, finally, I wouldn't say that I was underwhelmed, but I wasn't exactly overwhelmed either. It was a nice watch, and at $3,500, uh, this represented a really great value. Um, it was You could tell that it was a very solid watch, but one of the things that stood out to me is their use of the aluminum bezel, or I should say insert to be more accurate. It just looked cheap to me. And yes, I know there are a lot of things we can do finishing-wise, with aluminum, aluminum that we can't with steel and ceramic. But it just stood out to me and not in the best of ways. However, there's a lot of things I learned about that aluminum insert, which we'll talk about later. And then Tudor came out with the Black Bay Chronograph version, which excited me. In fact, this was one of the watches that I was considering as my next chronograph. The next chronograph that's been on my mind is the Tudor Heritage Black Bay. And at the time, the movement was more of a head scratcher, which has since become a deal breaker. Because that movement, it does bother me that they didn't go the full nine using an in-house movement. Instead, they had to modify a Breitling movement, which is a great movement. But the direction that Tudor was headed with the non-chronograph in-house movement should have been the same direction, in my opinion, that they should have installed in that chronograph, which would have made a, a bigger difference. Tudor finally took a step forward using their first in-house movement with their Black Bay 41, but then they took a step backwards by using a modified Brightly movement for their Black Bay chronograph. Come on, Tudor, you're better than that. But then something happened. What happened? Tudor introduced me to two watches in a row, meaning two steps forward, that converted me into a fan. It's beautiful. The first Tudor that converted me into a fan is their new Pepsi GMT. Not just because it looks like the Rolex GMT, but this is an actual GMT function for not a lot of money. The retail on this is $3,900 compared to the non-GMT function, which is about $3,700. So for $200 more, Tudor gives us an actual GMT function, which I really like. That Tudor doesn't gouge us with their prices. And I think it's very reasonable to say that Tudor owns the entry level three to four thousand dollar market but the creme de la creme for tudor which cemented my thumbs up for them is their new 58 and by the way the 58 is meant to commemorate the year 1958 which was the year of tudor's first diver's watch the 58 retails for about 3600 on the bracelet or only 3200 on the strap a really comfortable price point on a watch of this caliber in my opinion uh, this watch is definitely inspired by the vintage look, but for a watch to, to really look vintage they have to be thinner as well and not just smaller. And Tudor knew this, and Tudor executed on this. The standard Black Bay 41 is 41 millimeters, but it's also 14.75 millimeters thick, which is a pretty chunky watch, versus the 58, which is 39 millimeters. Uh, what a great size uh, to me. But it's also only 11.9 millimeters thick. Uh, that 2.76 millimeters might not seem a lot in the real world. If we're remodeling our kitchen and the contractor tell us, tells us, well, you're going to have 2.76 millimeters less of cabinet space or counter space, who cares? We wouldn't even notice that. But in a watch, that is a really big deal. And this also means that to fit this size watch, Tudor had to make the movement smaller. And they did, with an in-house movement as well. So does this mean Tudor finally went the full nine? <laughs> Well, not exactly. Again, I'm coming back to that aluminum insert. Now, uh, aluminum, the reason I was harping on that aluminum is because aluminum is a softer metal. So it's going to dent easier and it's going to scratch easier than steel or ceramic. I mean, we've all bumped our watches on our desk or, uh, or at the door. But the good news is, who cares? Because if something happens to the Tudor aluminum insert, we can always replace it for 60 bucks. That's all Tudor charges for that insert. So Hallelujah, big deal, we can replace it at any time, versus the Rolex ceramic insert, which is $200. Uh, for some reason, I thought it would be a lot more costlier 
to uh, to replace a ceramic insert by Rolex, but two hundred dollars seems kind of reasonable. But for sixty dollars for a tutor, uh, I would we would without hesitation just fix it if it needed to, and we would do the same for Rolex, but. For $200, we might just say, you know, I'll get around to it versus $60 where we would just, we would drop 60 bucks like that uh, if it needed it. It's just a sense of urgency becomes a little bit different when we're talking 60 bucks versus a couple hundred bucks. In fact, if we wanted to replace the entire bezel on off Tudor, it's $200, which is the same cost as the Rolex uh, ceramic insert. My point is that I'm glad that Tudor does not gouge us with disproportionate replacement costs. I've seen lesser expensive watches that are, this per, that disproportionately charge us for replacement costs. So kudos to Tudor for giving us peace of mind knowing that the service costs are really affordable. One of the cool things Tudor does on its website is what they call build your own watch, which is basically seeing what your watch would look like using different uh, aluminum bezel inserts or different dial colors. And the most impressive part is seeing what your watch would look like with a bracelet or a leather strap or a NATO strap. To me, that's handy. I would like to see what the watch looks like using a metal bracelet versus a leather strap. I wouldn't consider the NATO. And at the end, it reveals its price. Some of us are aware that just because a watch uses an in-house movement, it doesn't necessarily make it a quality movement. But Tudor makes a quality movement. They have 70 hours of power reserve, and a pretty good indicator of the quality of the movement is its power source. To put that into perspective, a lot of other watches have 38 hours of power reserve. And besides, doesn't a Rolex also have 70 hours of power reserve? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you the next time. So after having just sung Tudor's praises, if a situation came up where I could either choose the Rolex Submariner or the Tudor 58 for the same price, which watch would I buy? Well, I would still go for the Submariner, but I would probably wear the Tudor. If there ever was a time where I considered a Tudor to be a poor man's Rolex, not anymore. Or maybe more realistically, not as much anymore. I like the direction where Tudor is headed. So for the exact same cost, which watch of course. So at seven hours of power reserve, to put that into perspective, did I say seven or 70? Seven? It's okay, you can speak up, it doesn't matter. We'll just, we'll just use this as a blooper reel.